We're going to go into our message this uh, afternoon. It's going to be taken from the third chapter of the Gospel of John to about verse 21, somewhere in that area. And the title of today's message is Getting to the Crux of the Situation. Getting to the Crux of the Situation. Jesus and John talks about being born again and what it means to be born again. So he has this encounter with Nicodemus, who's a Pharisee. And so that's where we pick it up. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus who was a ruler of the Jews. But the same came to Jesus by night and he said unto him, Master, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that you do except God be with him. Now interestingly enough, Nicodemus didn't say, we know that you're a godly man. He said, we know that God is with you. You're a man sent from God. So he recognized that Jesus was not a normal man, that he had to be sent from God, that he had to come from God, because he could not do what he was doing unless God sent him. In other words, it was so clear it had to be this way. Now it's interesting, Jesus is sending so many signals here about who he is, and Jesus teaches in very real terms. He tells us what you have to do to make it to heaven, and he also tells us what we cannot do to make it to heaven. He makes things so clear. We like to speak around things today. We like to say, don't tell me what I can do, just tell me what I may do. We like that type of talk, and God doesn't talk like that. He's very straightforward, he's very real, he's right to the point. Because certain things will be deceived in and thinking we can go in that direction. And he's eliminating that possibility to let us know you can't go there. And interestingly enough, as he's teaching, as Nicodemus is saying these things, he came to Jesus by night. And he tells him that. He's making an affirmation that we know who you are. You're a teacher come from God. You've come from God. No man can do the miracles you do except God sent him. This is the affirmation that many people have not even gotten today, let alone gotten past. The evidence. We're of the assumption that if you give us the evidence in all things and in all realms, we'll make the right decision because we're reasonable people. But when it comes to God, that doesn't work that way. Because of sin, we're vested not to make the right choice when we see the evidence. We're not vested to make the right choice, which is why without the Spirit of God and you being born again, you can't make it. In other words, when it comes to the evidence for God, we don't act rationally. We do not act circumspectly. We try to deny it. Now, Nicodemus is interesting because he recognizes truth. He's drawn the truth, but he hasn't fully committed to it. And this is the level you have to be. So Jesus comes to him in verse 3 and says, Verily I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot what? He cannot see the kingdom of God. You must be born again to make it. In other words, he just cuts to the chase. Your rationalizations are true, but they're not going to get you to where you need to go. Reasoning God, seeing God, evidence for God is all wonderful. But that's not going to help you alone. You've got to be born again. And of course, Nicodemus, he's questioning this. How can that be? Can a man enter into his mother's womb and be born again? What are you talking about? And Jesus again answers something else in verse 5. Verily I say unto you, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Then he goes on to explain himself. That which is flesh is flesh, and that which is spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it listeth, and you hear the sound thereof, but you cannot tell where it's coming or whither it's going. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit of God. And so he comes and says, how can these things be? That's an interesting question. He's not questioning that they can't be. He's saying, how can they be? And Jesus says, are you a master of Israel, and you don't know these things? Now, that's a very interesting answer, because being a master of Israel, he should know these things. These are the things that he was put in charge to be able to disseminate to other people. And you're a master of Israel and you don't know these things? You don't know that there's a great God who's greater than all? Neither is there end of his understanding? You don't know that there's a God who said in Genesis 18, 14, nothing is impossible? You don't know that there's a God who in Luke 1, says nothing will be impossible to God? Or Jeremiah 32, 27, when he says nothing is impossible with God? And now you're saying, how can these things be? The very God that you've dedicated your life's work and your soul to, 
is the God who can do exceeding abundantly above all that you ask or think. Now, how is it you're a leader and you don't know that? And yet, when you challenge people today, that's really the crux of the issue. They don't believe that God is able to do exceeding abundantly everything they ask or think. We have the school of rationalism that doesn't believe in miracles. They're trying to understand sometimes biblically how you can interpret the Bible where there are no miracles. Well, you've got to take about 80% of it out. Because obviously, if you can't believe God is above you, then you can never come to a knowledge of who he is. You're behind Nicodemus. Nicodemus can at least see that Jesus' miracles prove he has to be sent from God. But he still can't believe that what Jesus is saying is true in spite of the miracles he's seen. So Jesus says that. He says, behold, we have seen and testified, and you don't receive our witness in verse 11. Isn't that interesting? You've heard and you've seen it, but you don't receive our witness. And he says, no man has ascended up to God, but he that has come down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. If I've come down from heaven, I can tell you things that you never heard before because nobody else is on that plane. No human being has ascended up to heaven in the place of God. But I've come down from heaven. I am in the right position and place to tell you all about God and to show you who God is. And God doesn't come without evidence. You see, the world is trying to train you to believe there's no evidence for God. There's no evidence for religion. Well, there's all evidence for God. Everything declares who he is. In fact, our own creation is evidence of God's hand. But everything, we can go on and on and on about the evidence of God. The Holy Spirit, we can go on about John's witness. We can go on about all the miracles which no other man did. All of which are far less to understand anything else in life. But when it comes to God, we say that's not the case. And so this is where Jesus is talking about. He says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life or eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, I want to go back to Nicodemus for a moment. The crux of the matter is seeing is not enough for you to believe which the world thinks that's not true. They think seeing is believing. No, you can see a lot about God, things you'll never see before consistently and still not believe. And that's the point. He's confessing what he knows to be true, but it's not getting him to the point of faith. He knows that Jesus has come from God. That seems to automatically say, okay, I believe in him, but it doesn't. You see, he's a ruler of the Jews and he's probably the most sincere of all of them. And he's coming and is still struggling. He knows the facts but he can't get from the facts to belief. So Jesus is getting to the point of where the problem is. The problem is you can have all of the facts, but you're not born again. You've got to be born of God. You've got to trust God. You see the facts as to why, now the step to do it is where you have to go. Many people know of God. Many people that are not even in church or in church have testified what God has done on their behalf, but they don't live for him. They don't surrender to him. They don't believe the Bible is absolutely true. They don't trust God's word for their own life. And this is what Jesus addresses. You must be born again. You cannot see the kingdom of heaven without it. To be born of water and of the spirit. He's talking about the spirit of the living God by which we're cleansed with living water. He says you can't go at it your way. You cannot control your way to God. But you can see it. But this is what you're going to have to do to get there. We can see that God is above us, but what it takes to get to God, we don't see. We think we can analyze and find out who he is. We think that we can use our minds to determine all truth. We think that we can use observation to, de to de determine truth, but we cannot. You can't just determine truth by using your methods. Now what it takes to get there is you're going to have to surrender. You're going to have to repent. You're going to have to turn from your ways and acknowledge you've got to go a whole different direction. And this direction is led by God, not by you. That's where everyone has to go. You can see why you need to learn of him, but to get there takes another step. And this step is what many people miss. You've got to realize he's the answer of eternal life. He's the only one who's over the resurrection. When you don't get to that knowledge, you'll never have eternal life. And everyone is questioning never to trust that knowledge, never to give over to Jesus absolutely, never to believe that he is the Son of God absolutely. And you can't get there without it, even with all of that evidence. Now, we say if we had that evidence, we'd be different. No, we wouldn't. 
The evidence of God has already been proven. And the ones who should have accepted it didn't believe. Belief is still rarity with all of the evidence that proves him. Therefore, there's something else that's causing us not to believe. That's a hardness of heart. It's a refusal to repent. And if you watch all other religions, what do you see absent? Repentance. What do you see absent? A savior who died in your place in order to save you by grace. You'll see that absent in all religions. Doesn't matter where it is. That absence is everything. And this is where Jesus is coming from. No man can do what you do except God be with him. Nicodemus realized he's not only different, he's the exception. Nobody else is like him in this way. But it still couldn't get him to faith. And Jesus talked about being born again. How can these things be? It's not of you. You have to surrender, but God does the work. That's what he's talking about. And then he begins to say about the condemnation of the world. He says he didn't come into the world in verse 17 to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That's interesting. Christ didn't come to condemn. He is to illuminate that you're already condemned, though. He is the way out of condemnation. Rejecting him is the way to seal condemnation. He said, whoever believes is not condemned, but he that believes not is condemned already in verse 18, because he refused to believe in the only begotten Son of God or the name of the only begotten Son of God. So those who do not believe that Jesus Christ is Lord are already condemned. He didn't say you had to commit a murder. He didn't say you had to commit a rape. He didn't say you had to be a serial rapist. He said that not believing in Christ as Lord already condemns you. And the way out of condemnation is to believe and trust in him and not yourself. And then he goes on in verse 19. This is the condemnation of the world. That light is coming to the world. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. In other words, the choices of all choices are here. Jesus Christ has given light to a dark world. And when the world sees the light, they recognize it. But they will not yield to it. They will still choose darkness when they have the option of seeing both. They will still choose evil when they have the option of seeing Christ as Lord. When they see it, they still love the darkness. That's the condemnation. Well, how many do that? Surprisingly, most. No one has to, because the light is coming to the whole world to lighten them, to give them a choice. But the love of the darkness is a choice that when both are seen, they will still choose the darkness rather than light. That's incredible. That is incredible. That when you have the light of eternal glory and you have the damnation of darkness, you will still choose the darkness over light. Could Jesus have made a mistake? No. Everyone that doeth truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be manifest that they are in God. But everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither comes to the light because he doesn't want his deeds reproved. In other words, they both see it. One comes and one doesn't. People often argue what makes one come and one doesn't. Why does one person come to the Lord and one person does not? Calvinists have assumed that that's because God is making one come and not making the other come. But Jesus never says that. He says they choose darkness rather than light. The darkness to choose is still their choice. God has given them the choice and he's also given the conclusions as to which choice they'll make. But they still have the right to the choice. But who wouldn't choose light when you have the difference between light and darkness manifested to you? So the key issue that makes Christianity totally different is that it says when you see the truth, you will still choose darkness. And humanity will say that's not true. Almost all humanity will go in that direction. They will say, no, if we see it, and we see it good enough, we will abide it. God says, no. No, you'll stay in darkness. But when you see the light, you have to grab it. Why? Because the light has a cost to it. You've got to forsake darkness to go to the light. You can't stay dark and go to the light. And because people want to hold on to the darkness, it means more than getting to the light without the darkness. And because they have that inexorable choice, they won't choose the right one. And yet, that's the choice that makes everyone saved. You see, a Christian is not a person who is better intrinsically than any other human. 
You may have a non-believer who's far more talented, far more knowledgeable, far more discerning. But that's not the issue. The issue is that a Christian trusts that they can't make it without Jesus. And a non-believer says, I got what I don't need Jesus for. And that's the great tragedy. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter how powerful you are. It doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter how much influence you exert. Ultimately, you're trading off Jesus for your own abilities. And you can't make that choice and make it. Not only you, but nobody can. So the only way to make it to heaven is to be fully persuaded that Jesus alone is Lord and only through him can I make it. And when you make that choice, you make it believing it for everyone. Everyone may not make it, but you're convinced that they have to do it to get there. That no one can make it on their own. You can't be a good person and make it to heaven because you're not good enough. Jesus died in order that his righteousness transfer to you. But if you think you're already righteous, you won't take it. He came not to save the righteous, but sinners and calling them to repentance. Well, nobody's righteous, but what he means is that if you insist that you're righteous, you won't repent and you won't be saved. You've got to recognize you're a sinner to repent. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. God has already told you where you stand. But if you don't believe it, if you want to override him, you're going to stand on your own recognizance and die forever. Hell is a horrible place. Hell is a place and nobody wants to go and nobody should ever want anyone to go there. Hell is a place where God is not. Hell is a place of everlasting torment. Your conscience, you can think, you can remember, you can recall, but you're tormented day and night. You never get any rest and you never have any hope. Hell is a place where there is no hope. But Jesus is the hope. The crux of the matter is, Jesus is Lord and he has proven. But what it's going to take to get there is not simply the knowledge. You're going to have to be born again of the spirit of the living God. You're going to have to humble yourself and realize that. That you're accepting Christ over against the world and over against your own thinking. That's what causes salvation. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Most holy and almighty Father, we give you thanks and praise. Your word is straightforward. We cannot get to heaven any other way. We cannot reason ourselves to assume we're right, but we have to blow, go where your spirit is blowing and trust you. Lord, guide us in our hearts so that more who have not humbled themselves will in this coming year. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Doors of the church open.